All right, I think we're ready to go. Thanks for showing up, everybody. Um, I know you could have chosen Lin Sun. Somehow we're always scheduled at the same time, so we fight and argue about how many people we get from each other. Um, so uh, this talk, I hope, is, is useful. It's, it's pretty 101. Uh, I put that in the title, so hopefully people wouldn't come expecting some extremely deep knowledge. But I actually had uh, the kind of idea for this talk years ago, and I'm not sure why I've never kind of put it together. Um, per my contract with the LF, you have to show at least one AI-generated image during your talk. So no, actually, that's a joke. Please don't go uh, talk to the LF about that. <clears throat> but the idea I had years ago is, um, you know, people come to the cloud native container world, um, and maybe they learn how to write a Docker file, and somebody tells them, hey, Docker files create this thing called an image, you push it to a registry, it's got these layers in it. And of course, there are people that dive very deep and, and learn what all that means. But <clears throat> my sense is that a lot of people, you know, n know the general terms, but haven't really understood what, what does that look like? What, what's actually happening? What's in that image? What, it, what is it composed of? And so uh, this talk, um, we'll try and combine those ideas with how, you know, things that maybe you heard this morning or yesterday are actually, you know, being implemented. What does it mean to sign a container, container image or attach an SBOM? Um, and, and hopefully I'll make the case that, that these things are actually critical and valuable to know as we try and start to implement and use these sort of newer capabilities uh, compared to sort of the raw initial uh, Docker image. So uh, level set, just before we get started, um, you know, Kubernetes just had a 10th birthday, Docker just had a 10th birthday. So, you know, roughly 10 years ago, Docker became, was gaining popularity, um, and they created this initial image spec. It's not the one I'm listing here, uh, the original V1 spec, uh, actually a fun history tidbit had a bunch of kind of weaknesses and a young uh, Finnish, uh, I, don't, I believe he was out of college, but a young, a young Finnish guy sent Docker privately a bunch of uh, issues with the Docker image spec, the original one. Um, they were pretty bad. And so Docker created the V2 image spec, hired that guy, and if you use BuildKit, Tanis is the creator of BuildKit and works for Docker today, but uh, that's just a little bit of history into how we came up with this specification we have today where everything's verifiable with the SHA-256 sums and the, the directed acyclic graph that it's based on. So that's uh, the image spec, what, what we, in the Docker world was version 2.2. That transition happened around Docker 1.10, maybe 2016, maybe 2015 actually. So it's been a long time. This is, most people coming to the container world today, you've only ever used the current modern Docker image spec uh, when you use Docker build or Docker push or whatever tool you're using. Uh, that was formalized into the OCI image specification which reached 1.0 um, in summer of 2017. So, you know, whether you're using the OCI spec or you still have images in the Docker format, they're compatible, they roughly mean the same thing. And so uh, the bottom line is when we talk about container images, we hope, hopefully are just talking about an image that conforms to the OCI specification. And if someone says Docker image, okay, that roughly, you know, we're talking about the same thing. So with that level set uh, of understanding, let's talk about our five uh, things that I wanted to, to share with you about container images. I've already uh, mentioned offhand the SHA-256 sums and the, the DAG, and so that gives us verifiability uh, because a container image is really just a collection of objects that all have a hash assembled in a, in a DAG, um, not to give you PTSD if you've recently interviewed for a job and had to do some kind of graph traversal, but that's the, the basic technology that, that this is based on. So each of those pieces has a descriptor 
that has this digest, this hash, sum, and a media type so that tools that you know, interact with the image know what to do, what is this thing. And so the most common image that you would find in a registry has three main components. It's a manifest, a config, uh, which if, you, if you've ever typed Docker inspect your image name, you can see in there the config that has, and that's part of the OCI runtime spec, has like the environment variables, what's the entry point to the container, you know, what are the, if you've got volumes, what are the mount points? So that's all part of this config object. And then it has an array of layers. And again, based on your Docker file or whatever tool you're using to build, um, you know, this represents the layers that were built uh, that create that uh, copy on write file system when your container image is going to be run. So again, this is the most common thing. Obviously, as I said, each one of these things will be hashed. And these aren't full uh, 256 sums because I didn't have enough room on the slide, but you get the idea. Each one has a hash. And then uh, the other sort of most common component of the OCI image spec is that you can combine multiple manifests into an index. In the Docker world, we called this a manifest list. And the main goal uh, when we created the manifest list was to support multi-platform images. So the same reference, the same image name, could support multiple uh, you know, operating system, our CPU architecture combinations by combining them into an index that had an array of manifests. So each manifest would represent a different architecture, for example. And each one of those would be summed. And then, of course, the index, the new parent, would have a hash as well. So this is, again, roughly uh, the mental model you should have as we, as we talk about all the other properties. But before we do that, um, you know, I thought I'd try during this talk to be somewhat hands-on so that you know, I'm not just throwing out terms and words on a slide and we can actually see that. Um, yeah, that looks kind of small, doesn't it? I'm, this is gonna be a fun fight between the the length of SHA-256 sums, so we're not like wrapping lines a lot. But let's try. <clears throat> Does that look bigger? Yeah. All right, so I wrote a, a tool years ago. There's tons, this is just one of many tools you could use to poke into images, Crane, RegCTL, um, there's a bunch out there. Um, so we're just gonna look at a very simple image, Alpine, if you've ever used uh, you know, lightweight Alpine Linux. Um, these images only have one layer, so they're kind of uh, basic in the output, which helps because there's gonna be a lot of information on the screen. Um, but it does support a lot of architecture. So if I run this, um, I'm at the very end, you can see that uh, essentially there are eight entries. If I scroll back to the top of this output, here's that media type for this particular image, again, it's, it's using the Docker v2.2 media type. It could, have, it could be an OCI index, they're compatible. Here's the, that outer digest of the entire index or manifest list. And it says this contains eight manifest re references. And so there's eight different uh, platform objects here. You can see this first one is x86-64 Linux again, commonly used on Intel AMD machines. Um, and then there's gonna be a bunch of ARM supporting everything from Raspberry Pi up to like AWS Graviton, 64-bit uh, power, uh, RISC-V, and even Z Linux, the IBM mainframe architecture. So I can run Alpine on any of those and the container runtime that reads this index will then do the matching and, and pull again inside each one. Each manifest has its own digest. And within that, there's this layer and there's obviously that config object as well. All right, so we kind of at least have the idea about how this maps, you know, those concepts I talked about, manifest, config, layers, and wrapping that in a broader index. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, when we're talking about verifiability, if I've got Containerd installed, I can, you know, switch to root 
and go down into this blob store, this blob uh, directory within the content store, and I can start to see these things. I can start to look at the SHA-256 sums. Here, I've grabbed um, the config out of uh, the ARM v6 uh, piece of Alpine Linux. And there's two things I'm, I'm trying to show here. Um, one is that uh, this is obviously JSON. I've run the file command. It's told me it's JSON data. Um, and I've also run SHA-256 sum to just show that, of course, the hash matches the, the actual hash that, that the registry told us that was encoded in the manifest above it. And obviously, if that didn't match, then when I pulled this image, I would have gotten a verific verification failure as the runtime pulled the image and did that sum uh, on each piece as it pulled it. Um, and obviously, if I, as root, edit this file, I break that verifiability. In fact, the image no longer works. Uh, because if I really want to change something, obviously that changes its sum, and then I need to change the manifest, and that changes the outer manifest. So again, this is the verifiability aspect of containers and the container image format. All right, so the second thing I wanted to talk about that uh, is more uh, relevant to this conference is that container images are now signable. Uh, that's something people have been working on for a number of years. And really, there's, there's sort of two ecosystems that have, that have grown up uh, together. Uh, you've probably heard people here talking already uh, today or yesterday about SigStore and Cosign. Uh, I believe Notary and Notation have been mentioned. Uh, both of these use the same uh, model when we're talking about images of actually signing, and that's based around work that's been happening in the OCI for the distribution spec 1.1. And there's a couple things uh, to point out about that. There's a, there's a lot you can go dig into. There's blog posts that have been written. Um, but one of these uh, things that we wanted to solve is people were sort of finding ways to attach things to images through sort of uh, a bit of hackery, you know, creating an index where one of the entries wasn't an actual image, it was some other thing, like a signature or an SBOM. And so we formalized the artifact definition as part of the OCI 1.1 spec, which gives a new artifact type uh, where you can specify the media type, and we'll talk about that later in the presentation. We added the subject field, so you can create a artifact like a signature or an SBOM, and in the subject, you put the SHA-256, or container ID, if you will, of the thing that you're referencing, the thing that you're related to, what am I signing? And then related to that, we added an API in the distribution spec called the refers API, which you can ask a registry that implements uh, the 1.1 spec. I'm looking at this image, who are the refers? Who, ha who has a subject field of this image? Is it an SBOM, a signature, some other artifact associated, some kind of attestation? Um, and so that's, again, these are all fairly new. This was just released um, in the last six to 12 months. And so registries are just now uh, putting in support for it. So cosine and notation both use what's known as the fallback method supported by OCO OCI 1.0 registries, which again is a basically uh, every registry today, um, that allows it to use a special tag if the subject field and the refers API aren't available. Uh, so again, let's look at what this looks like and uh, see if we can. So I've taken this Alpine Linux um, image, I've pushed it to a local registry I'm using Finch, which is a Docker clone that my team at AWS created uh, for Mac OS and Windows. And I'm, yeah, so I'm running a registry that does happen to support the 1.1 1 .1, 1 spec that came out of the ORAS project. Um, and so it's running um, on localhost 5000, a common you know, port that people use for localhost registries. And so I've pushed this Alpine image to this local registry, um, but we've added support, and you can obviously use the cosine client tools 
or I can use Finch to actually sign this with cosine and notary, and then I can then I can verify that. Um, I've put these in little shell scripts because uh, watching me type is probably not that interesting. Um, so here I'm using uh, Google's OAuth to uh, do um, certificateless uh, keys. So, um, you know, basically it's going to be signed by my Gmail account effectively. And so I've done that, and there's a lot of words here. Uh, SigStore is mentioning, um, you know, some agreements and information. And uh, you can ignore this last part that I'm also, I have Sochi support in this uh, version of Finch, and it's like, oh, you're not creating any table of contents for your image. Um, but at this point, I've pushed, I, Cosign has signed the image, I pushed it uh, to my localhost registry, and so I should be able um, to, to see that. Actually, I'll, I'll just do um, verify, and so you can see the command I'm running here is I'm making sure that the signature is estesp at gmail.com and that the OIDC issuer is the Google uh, provider and then obviously my registry uh, reference there. So uh, yeah, lots of stuff on, uh, <laughs> on the screen here uh, because I've just dumped everything. But here at the top, Cosign tells you the Cosign claims were validated uh, they were verified offline, was verified using trusted certificate authority certificates. And then obviously you can JQ this uh, JSON and pull out information that you want to verify about that signature. So again, we've used cosign to sign the Alpine image, push it to a local registry, and obviously you can read a lot more about uh, cosign's options, other, other capabilities uh, they support. So let's uh, also do that with notation. Um, so this uh, is simpler. I've already done the step of creating a test certificate locally for, for notation. Uh, again, it's done that, that signing and pushed it to a registry. And I will go over here inside the VM because for some reason the notation client was having problems with localhost and IPv6 to get across that boundary. So I will do, um, I'll do notation inspect of that image that I pushed. Alpine notation is the tag I gave it. And again, you can see all this information about the fact that I signed this specific SHA of Alpine with this signature, and here's all the certificates involved and the artifact. Um, so again, I you know a lot more that you can read up on you know various capabilities, how to certificate, how does certificate management work with each of these. But I wanted to give you the essence of you know these are capabilities again related to the image format and the image spec and how these signatures are actually attached to the image. All right, uh, the third thing I wanted to talk about was uh, that's maybe uh, less used than image signing and maybe less, people are less aware about it, but this idea that I could actually encrypt uh, an image, but specifically this is about encrypting image layers. And this work came out of, uh, if you've heard of the Con Confidential Computing Consortium or you know, Trusted Execution Environments, uh, the people involved in that wanted a way to provide um, security all the way from image construction until it's time to run that image within some kind of trusted enclave or environment where you would decrypt that only that would have access to the key, be able to decrypt uh, the image at that point. Maybe your image has the secret recipe for your brand's favorite food and you, no one can get near that and so it has to be uh, protected. 
Um, obviously, encrypting the Alpine Linux image is not that useful, uh, but as an example, uh, that's what I've done here. Um, and, you know, fairly, fairly straightforward. The only thing that changes here is that you can see my layer media type has changed from that standard, you know, tar gzip format to this plus encrypted format. Um, the, you can read a lot more about this uh, in the OCI Crypt project on GitHub. The URL is there. I'll have these slides posted later uh, so you can follow all these links. If that's of interest to you or you're involved in that space, uh, obviously the encryption um, can happen at push time, and I can show that here in a minute. Um, the interesting work that, that this community is still kind of wrestling with is not having container runtime need to have access to unpack and ver therefore need to decrypt at pull time, but they would like you know the image to not be decrypted and unpacked until it's within that enclave. So there's some work going on there to try and separate those responsibilities between the container runtime that may be in a host environment versus the actual workload running in the enclave or protected environment. Um, and again, I'll just uh, show that briefly. Um, So, uh, you know, I've used OpenSSL to generate this mypubkey.pem. So I've specified that as a recipient. I've specified which platform I'm packaging up. And then the last uh, uh, part there is where, where to actually push that. So again, I've asked for that to be um, pushed to my localhost 5000 registry as Alpine with the tag encrypted. Uh, and then uh, on that previous slide, I showed the uh, output of inspecting that image and seeing that the layer uh, is encrypted. And uh, we could do that now, but uh, you know, you've seen that on the slide uh, already. Uh, the fourth uh, topic I wanted to present is, is really a combination of kind of the last few we've looked at. And that is that, that we've created the OCI image to be an extensible format. And so OCI 1.1 is, is a move in that direction. Um, there are two examples I wanted to give that are really outside of sort of the container native, the Linux or Windows container native space. One is the container D's run WASI shim and the run WASI project. Um, I don't know how many of you might have been at KubeCon Paris, but there was a keynote uh, I think with uh, Zeiss Optical and Spin and Fermion was there talking about the implementation of this and how they're using it. Um, so RunWASI essentially uses the standard OCI image manifest, but of course the WASM binary itself is not a root file system with, with a bunch of files, it's just the WASM binary. And so uh, if you go to the RunWASI project, and they have a couple docs on there about their um, design discussions and decisions. They ended up with this custom media type that I've listed here, uh, you know, based around the Bytecode Alliance uh, uh, work that's going on. Um, they had other, you know, ideas. There's a Google doc, you can go read kind of how they ended up with this, but this allows them to again, push an image to a registry that conforms to the OCI spec but when you uh, run it with container D, it, the run WASI shim knows how to interpret that, how to read that layer type, pull out the WASM binary, hand it to the WASM runtime, and therefore, uh, you know, again, use the extensibility of this format to allow them to run things that are not traditional container images. Um, some people may or may not know that Homebrew has switched to use OCI images for their package delivery mechanism. Again, they're using a near standard uh, OCI image manifest format. And I say near because they've added some content in there that doesn't really uh, conform to the definitions in the OCI that are you know, unique to homebrew packages. But they're significantly using annotations, which are part of the spec, which allow their brew tooling to read those annotations and then 
you know, make the right choices about where to pull uh, the actual binary content from, from the registry. Um, I do have a quick, um, we, can, we can inspect one of their um, images. And so I'm using Crane here because it shows all the annotations. So you can see this is, um, what are we looking at here? You can see actually they've used the same concept of all these different manifests to support different versions of Mac OS. Um, and this is the part that doesn't really necessarily conform to the OCI spec as OS version is either reserved or only supposed to be used by Windows for Windows kernel versions. But they've kind of created their own format for that to support different versions of Mac. Ah, right, so I'm just using their hello package as, a, as an example. Um, you saw that each of the entries has some annotations. This brew bottle digest is really the key to how they uh, pull the right content. And then at the very end, there were all these annotations that again, allow them to, for their tooling to, to know how to show you names and descriptions and various things. So again, uh, these are two interesting examples of the extensibility of the OCI image format and ways that it's actually being used even in non-container native uh, ways today. So the OCI 1.1 spec, I mentioned that earlier on, um, has added a very specific guideline for artifact usage, again, to try and hope to, um, to sort of bring all these sort of unique hacks that people have done to try and package various kinds of things in the OCI image spec in a more conformant way. And so artifact type is a big part of that, you know, this new media type that lets you specify different artifacts. And the other thing we've done is created things called, you know, the empty layer definition. So say the artifact you're packaging has no concept of layers, instead of just not having that field, um, you can create, uh, you can use this empty layer definition. It has its own media type here, you can see, and its own digest that's pre-computed pre uh, with size two. Um, so again, this guideline, uh, the URL is, is kind of long. Again, I'm, I'll be happy to share these afterwards so you can click on this and read more. But this guideline basically says, hey, you want to extend the OCI format to represent some other kind of artifact. Here's the best way to do that so that as tools consume these images, uh, we're not in a world where everyone's trying to do uh, the same thing in very different ways. So finally, um, my, my claim after kind of walking through these first four is that container images and some of these features we've added to the spec are really integral to the secure supply chain. Uh, obviously the most natural uh, part of that is, is the artifacts like SBOMs and signatures uh, being enabled to be associated with images in the registry. Uh, but there are other pieces of that as well. So, um, you know, this picture on the left has been used in a few blog posts around the time of the OCI 1.1 spec. Some of the media types are, are shortened just for creating this image. But again, the visualization is that I've got an image, I can now attach signatures, SBOMs, I can sign the SBOM signature and nest that under the SBOM. All this is enabled by, you know, the artifact guidelines and the OCI spec as it stands today. Um, and so there's a lot of advancements that have come that some, some have adopted uh, these specific OCI 1.1 uh, techniques. Some are using uh, different techniques that have existed before that. Uh, but a couple I wanted to mention, you know, BuildKit um, now has SBOM and attestation support since version 0 0.11, I think uh, about a year ago, actually a little over a year ago that was released. Um, so we can look, uh, we'll look at that briefly, what that looks like. Kubernetes, if, if you were here for the keynotes, Puerco talked about all the work in happening in the Kubernetes uh, project. They're working on uh, achieving higher levels of Salsa compliance, which means you know, signing their images, uh, signing the releases, adding SBOMs. 
Um, and so that's, that's been in place since I think uh, 1.26. Um, progress on SPDX, so again, some of the standards were talked about this morning in the keynotes. And obviously, you know, tools like SIFT and Docker Scout, uh, some of the standards, um, you know, are, as Puerco talked about, you know, the, the trick is sort of having that virtuous cycle where people are actually adopting these things and using them, and therefore they're becoming more useful because more tools support them and more projects are generating the right information and, and associating it with their project. And there's a couple of references here as well that will be available. Um, so let, let's show two things that I wanted to show you before we, we finish up. Uh, one, I mentioned the build kit now supports provenance and attestations. Um, and what that looks like if I inspect the Moby build kit image, um, let me go back to the top here. Again, it's an image that has a lot of support for different platforms. Um, so it says it contains 12 manifest references and that means there's an index that's wrapping 12 um, manifests, but only six of those are OCI images and six of them are attestations for each of those images. So again, we're gonna see you know, standard images with layers for different platforms. But then at the end we see um, that we have image manifests that have this attestation manifest type. And so they have their own digest and if we went to the content store and, and catted out one of these files, we'd find that this is an actual, you know, S, I think they're SPDX format attestations um, associated so that, again, given the right tooling, you can now attest that this Moby build kit image, um, you know, has certain content or is signed in a certain way. And so that's uh, one example. And then I talked about Kubernetes um, so if we look at, um, again, this is output from cosine, so it's a little verbose, um, but what I've done is I've run cosine verify the kube API server from v1.26 when they started signing it. Uh, I've verified, you know, the issuer and the identity that the Kubernetes release engineering team uses and it says the cosine claims were validated, and then again, all this information about the image itself. So again, these um, capabilities are being adopted by projects like Kubernetes and additional projects as they are onboarding these capabilities like Perco talked about. Um, so again, my, my basic goal was to say that first, it's good to kind of understand these concepts, the OCI image spec, what does an image look like, how are these new kind of capabilities and artifacts associated with images? And effectively, this is hopefully going to be valuable to the adoption of these technologies in your project, in commercial projects, in the open source kind of foundations that we're all depending on. So that's all I had, and I only have a minute and a half left. So thank you so much uh, for your time. So I think until that clock hits zero, I'm, I can take questions. So any burning questions or else I'll hang out out in the hallway afterward as well if, uh, if you have a question you don't want to say publicly. Yes? How much does uh, do tools that come out of the box like with Docker, for example, support the signing aspect of it? Yeah, so the question was, you know, out of the box, uh, where are tools, with, are they enabled with support for features like signing? Um, you know, I'd say it's hit or miss, obviously. Uh, I actually don't know about Docker Desktop and where they are with integration of signing. I think they were part of the notation work with, with Microsoft and AWS, uh, but I don't know how integrated it, it is. Obviously today, I mean, like a lot of things in, in our world, you know, each tool has its client. You can use them all separately. Um, we've started doing the integration with Finch, as I showed here. 
so that people can start to use them, you know, in combination without having to go download another tool. Uh, but I think hopefully we'll see that that sort of steamroll as more people are using, you know, when it becomes natural, of course I sign my, my images during CI uh, with some official signature. Uh, I think we'll see better integrations as, as we go. What about Kubernetes and SDKs? Uh, so, you know, Kubernetes is now signing releases, producing SBOMs. The SBOMs are not attached to the image. Uh, I, don't, I guess I didn't mention that, but uh, they have a, a part of the Kubernetes docs that says verifying our artifacts. And it shows you how you can pull the SBOMs and how you can verify them. So they're currently separate. Um, so, uh, you know, EKS obviously is built on those public releases. Uh, but I don't believe there's any signatures or SBOMs for the additional parts that they're adding. So again, we're kind of in that phase where people are just starting to figure out what it means to adopt some of these technologies. And hopefully, you know, we're a year or so into that life cycle. So hopefully you start to see that become regular across, you know, more and more projects. All right, thanks so much.